Flying can be frustrating. In Australia, our choices are limited. So this is my fourth flight for this story, and it's my third delayed flight. Late last night, Qantas cancelled our flight for this morning. No explanation given. There's a graveyard of airlines that have tried and failed to give us more options. Rex and Bonza are just the latest. More competition would mean better prices, better service. Australia's domestic aviation market is among the most concentrated in the world. Okay. Who is to blame for Rex's current situation? This is the inside story of what happened to Rex. Rex had an impeccable record. For the first time, we hear from the men in charge. You have to say that the buck stops somewhere and it stops at the top and he was at the top. It's a journey that's taken us from remote South Australia to America's Wild West. Did Rex steal four planes from a company in the US? How do you do that in broad daylight? From accusations of stolen aircraft to allegations of money laundering. It is incredibly bizarre. Aviation is dominated by big personalities. They war with each other like sky gods. They use their airlines as proxies for their ambitions of domination. When their dreams come crashing down, it's the rest of us who pay the price. Okay. So tell me who you are and what we're doing, Ken. Uh, my name's Ken Maynard. I'm the Mayor of the District Council of Sejuna. How would you describe the importance of aviation in a town like Sejuna? I consider it to be essential. Sejuna, South Australia. Almost 800 kilometres from Adelaide and a world away from the country's busy east coast. Melbourne is closer to Adelaide than we are, just as an example. So to go to Adelaide, it's a bit of a trip. Uh, in the motor vehicle, it's about at least nine hours, whereas the plane, it's about an hour and 20 minutes. Mayor Ken Maynard describes it as the tyranny of distance. We're fortunate we do have a range of specialists that come to town, but a lot of people have to go to Adelaide for medical reasons. Obviously, we've got some treatments here, but not everything. Sejuna's airport has been a lifeline for many who live in the region. When I was going away for treatment, I'd be back on a Friday night just in time to watch Caden play footy. Must have been pretty buggered though. Yes, that's why it was always pizza night, because I wasn't coming home and cooking. Are you ready to go? My name's Renee Elliott. I live in sunny old Streaky Bay. Come on, Dylan. Come on. I've been home here over 20 years now, so we're eight and a half, nine hours from Adelaide. So very remote when it comes to having medical attention. Renee Elliott has flown far more than she'd ever anticipated. She's been diagnosed with breast cancer twice. Sejuna is the closest airport. I've actually flown 38 times since January. So having my fortnightly treatment and then my weekly and then back to radio. At the end of the day, it's about being home and try to get through as much as I could with the support of my kids and my family. So yeah, not having Rex flying out of Sejuna would be very detrimental in that respect. 
It's a growing anxiety. Rex is the only airline servicing Sejuna, and its future is under a cloud. Rex Airlines has entered voluntary administration amid serious financial troubles with questions about its future viability. The regional carrier has been losing a million dollars a week. The airline is still flying in the regions while its administrators hunt for a new owner. For people like Renee, it's an unsettling time. People that live in the cities have got the alternative that they can either public transport it to somewhere or train it, for instance, or they've got a vast array of flights that they can take. Um, yeah, we have no choice, we have wrecks. Rex, short for Regional Express, was built from the collapse of ANSET in 2002. It combined two smaller carriers, Kendall and Hazelton, to pick up ANSET's regional routes. Rex was launched by the then Federal Transport Minister. while the airline's inaugural boss kept everyone on schedule. The company's motto places its loyalties in regional Australia. Australia's friendliest and most reliable airline now brings you to Sydney three times a day. Rex, our heart is in the country. But that's not the experience of every community. As the only carrier on many regional routes, the airline has built a fiefdom. Some will attest its leadership can display the behaviour to match. How would you describe Rex to deal with as a business? Um, can we stop there for a sec? How much bargaining power does the council have when it comes to dealing with Rex? Uh, I would say, in reality, very little. We have to remember that, in my view, we need Rex more than they need us. Councils run many of the nation's vital regional airports. They charge fees to airlines for services like security screening. I'll just get you to introduce yourself, your name and your title for the tape. Sure. Murray Wood, Chief Executive Officer, Dubbo Regional Council. When it comes to negotiations, Rex has a reputation for playing tough. Councils are used to vigorous conversations, but that can be done respectfully and professionally. Um, I, to be honest, I haven't had, from what I can see, the relationship with Rex is uh, unique. In 2019, Dubbo announced a fee increase to help fund airport upgrades. Rex sent Dubbo residents a letter signed by the airline's chairman, describing the council as either very corrupt or very incompetent, self-serving and bigoted. It threatened to stop flying to the regional city. How much extra was Rex being asked to pay the council? It was $1.99 per passenger. The airline decided to wear the cost and stay in Dubbo. But this is not the only council to face the wrath of Rex. Ready to go? We're ready. My name is Phil Stone and I'm the Mayor of the City of Wyala. For almost a decade, this steel town flanked by desert and sea had two airlines, Rex and Qantaslink. When the council resolved to introduce security screening at a cost to both carriers, a service only required for the type of planes flown by Qantas, Rex's reaction was fierce. Mayor, I have two press releases here that Rex put out. I was going to read the words that, that we've highlighted. Okay. Devious and underhanded, ungrateful. Council has been deliberately deceptive. Rex believes that while a council has lost all of its credibility. I've never read anything so, do I say spiteful, so aggressive, 
because at no stage was the council and those negotiating with Rex at the time devious and underhanded. Wyala is now a one airline town, reliant on Qantas Link. Regional monopolies can cost residents. In Sejuna, Rex can charge up to $600 one way for the 90 minute flight to Adelaide. They are a bit hard business people. We haven't increased our fees, for example, the last eight years, with an aim to try and keep fares at the lowest possible. But uh, they are in the business of business, and that's the way it is. They do have the upper hand, but that's just the cards we're dealt with. We have to be realistic. Yeah, we can't afford to lose them. Rex's motto is, our heart is in the country. Do you think they've been displaying that? We would say not. The route between Melbourne and Sydney is one of the busiest in the world and the most lucrative in Australia. In 2020, Rex declared it wanted a slice of the spoils. We're now going to do a, a, a ribbon cutting in a few moments' time in the archway. Using COVID grants to support its regional routes, it then secured private equity to lease jets. Its plan was to take on a pandemic-weakened Virgin by flying between capital cities. Rex is really taking on the big guys. We are the, the underdog. They were good small town operators and they should have stuck to their bread and butter uh, and consolidated in that way. They, they were just, it was a bit like be the Beverly Hillbillies. One, two, three, here's the cup. The so-called Golden Triangle, the route between Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane, is littered with the carcasses of those who have gone before. Compass launched as Australia's first low-cost carrier in 1990. It failed twice. Next came Impulse. It was eventually absorbed by Qantas. Tiger Air tried to stake its claim in 2009. It was bought by Virgin and shut down in 2020. Australia once had legislation protecting the two incumbent airlines from new entrants. It's no longer law and those carriers are long gone, but the duopoly remains our reality. Research tells us airfares fall when there's more competition. But today, nine out of 10 domestic passengers fly with Qantas or Virgin. It's this context that makes Rex's entry on the Golden Triangle especially audacious. Why would you risk shareholders' money in a venture taking on two very established and financially fit competitors now who've just gone through? Virgin went through a reorganisation, Qantas got the chance to reorganise. They're as financially fit as they've probably ever been, and then you jump into their space, well, you're gonna get a competitive backlash. Both airlines are fiercely protective of their slice of the sky. I'm Joe Aston. I'm a former uh, newspaper columnist at the Australian Financial Review. And now I'm about to be the author of a book about Qantas called The Chairman's Lounge. Uh, Qantas is a very aggressive competitor, hyper aggressive. Many of its competitors have found that out the hard way, um, have found that out the fatal way. Uh, Rex is just the latest. Our investigation has found that after Rex entered the lucrative Golden Triangle, Qantas increased the number of low-cost Jetstar seats available on its city routes, while also entering 10 of Rex's regional routes. What Qantas does is use its superior scale to put unbearable pressure on the profits of their competitors. I mean, that's what, what big monopolies do. They have bigger pricing power, so they can uh, lower their prices and still e either not lose money or, or not lose very much money, but crush the smaller operators. While Qantas circled with cheap seats, Virgin often matched Rex's lower pricing. Qantas are the dominant player in the market and Respectfully, they do whatever it takes, I would argue legally, to protect that position. 
Virgin today is the second carrier in the market and they're doing their damnedest to protect that position. As long as the two don't do that in a coordinated fashion, I think the market benefits. It's sort of a sign of, if you like, silent, not illegal, but silent cooperation between Qantas and Virgin to drive the third player out of the market. In a statement, Qantas said Jetstar's growth reflects increased demand for low-cost leisure travel and was not directed at Rex. The airline also rejected the suggestion that it coordinates on pricing or network with Virgin. Virgin told us it welcomes competition. The airline giants have also been accused of blocking competitors' access to Sydney Airport. In the immediate aftermath of Rex's decline, partial blame was placed on the system that determines whose planes get to land and when. We need to make sure that our domestic aviation system is open to new players to provide that competition. Um, and getting access into Sydney Airport is a key component of that. The company that hands out takeoff and landing slots is majority funded by Qantas and Virgin, but the person who runs it disputes they have any say in her decision making. The CEO, which is myself, I'm the slot manager, is responsible for the allocation of slots and to ensure that we are abiding by the rules provided to us by the Australian Government and by the World Airport Slots Board as well. Petra Popovac says it's not her fault Rex struggled to compete. It received most of the slots that they applied for and all of the slots in the peak period that were, they, were, they were wanting to operate. They had too many in the peak, so they handed some back. The slots are not the problem here. The government has announced reform to Sydney's slot system since Rex entered voluntary administration. But what happened at the airline goes way beyond airport access. This sort of half-baked uh, venture of, of taking on Qantas and, and being the third uh, major domestic airline was just, just such a strategic error, but such an obvious strategic error. Um, it, it sort of smelled of, of fantasy or of, um, of a, well, it's always ego. <laughs> Uh, a and B, Mark. OK, rolling. Yes, please. Uh, Emily, where will you be sitting? Over I'll be here. There. OK. Hi, Emily. Hi, Mr. Lim. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, how's it all been going? It's been good. Do you have a good time with Kim High? Coffee, you ready to go? Yes, I'm totally ready to go. Rex was run by the same two men for almost two decades. Singaporean businessman Lim Kim High and former Federal Transport Minister John Sharp. Why would a Singaporean businessman get involved in a regional Australian airline? Very good question. I have only two words. I was stupid and I was naive. This is the first time since Rex entered voluntary administration that the men have gone public. They're no longer on speaking terms. How would you describe Mr Lim now? Well, uh... It's a difficult thing to describe Mr Lim now without um, expressing views that are probably best not to say in a public place. There's one thing that Lim Kim Hai and John Sharp agree on, that Qantas was a factor in the troubles facing Rex. Was it a mistake to go into domestic market? It was a mistake to assume that Qantas would behave responsibly. What they did was to try to cut us off at the roots and they went into the regional markets to make sure that we do not get any profits. What I don't think we had uh, taken into account was just the, uh, if you like, the vindictiveness of Qantas who decided, right, OK, we're going to really teach Rex a lesson. We're going to go into these markets, undermine their regional business, take away the, the income that they have in that regional business, which can support their domestic business startup, and that'll kill them off. And they did it ruthlessly, uh, and they were successful. 
Qantas says its move into Rex's regional routes was in response to demand. The ACCC told Four Corners it has investigated concerns raised by Rex and that they did not meet the threshold for further action. John Sharp admits Rex should have been better prepared. Was the gamble on intercity operations worth it? Hindsight would say no. I think it was the beginning of, of what became a, a very bad chapter in the, in the history of the company. Rex was a company with an unusual structure. Lim Kim Hai was not only the executive chairman, but also the largest shareholder. He had a hand in every aspect of the business. The words that stung regional councils were his. You've been described in, in different ways. A micromanager, a strategist, sometimes rude, successful, unhinged, also generous. I tend to agree to all the adjectives that you have mentioned. With unhinged? That depends on your definition of unhinged. The reason why I managed to be successful is because some of these so-called unhinged decisions are decisions that most people wouldn't make. Rex had an impeccable record, both in terms of its operations and in terms of its financial um, capability. So, Obviously, I did something right for over 20 years. As his deputy, John Sharp had long appeared loyal to Lim Kim Hai. But with the airline in trouble, the former Nationals MP is now distancing himself from how the boss did business. The language that's been used has been used uh, uh, primarily. It's, it's Kim Hai's way of doing things. We've had many arguments as to how those comments and statements should be made. With respect, it sounds like a bit of a cop-out, doesn't it, to say that that's all on him. He just did his own thing. There's nothing we could do about it. Well, I th you can call it a cop-out, but I would, just, I would say to you it's an explanation of how it worked. Maybe we should have done more. I don't know what we could have done more, because at the end of the day, he holds the power within the company. I've always taken the stand that if you make a public remark about Rex, we will hold you accountable to it. It became an issue when we started to lose money. So it was an issue, but they grudg grudgingly accepted it when the airline is doing well. And Rex, when it was a regional carrier run by Lim Kim Hai, was profitable. But its financials show that after entering the city routes, the passenger service began bleeding cash. John Sharp says earlier this year, the board proposed changes in strategy, in particular, better marketing. All of those were rejected at the time by the then executive chairman. This was the beginning of the end. When it became apparent there were problems and he wasn't fixing them, that's when everybody on the board decided it was time to do something that we had never done before, and that is to ask Kim Hai to step down. There was another thing that increased tensions at the top of Rex. Did Rex steal four planes from a company in the US? I'm aware of this allegation. In the dry desert of Arizona, just off Route 66, it's a storage facility holding planes, including those Rex needed for spare parts. The regional carrier paid a deposit on four of these aircraft in 2019. What happened next is now playing out in court. Jet Midwest alleges Rex arranged to have the aircraft collected, their wings sawn off, and the parts shipped to Australia without its knowledge. Lim Kim Hai says Rex didn't steal the planes. When you accuse somebody of theft, it must mean that I come without your knowledge to take something from you. How do you do that in broad daylight over several weeks on an aircraft that is so big? And just to be clear, sorry. John Sharp claims the first he heard of the situation was when the directors received a legal threat in March. You can imagine 
here we are where you know the, the business is not trading well there's no plan to turn the business around and all of a sudden we get this letter land on our doorstep saying these aircraft uh, allegedly have been bought by you and, and have now not been paid for and you can almost argue well, that was the straw or one of the straws that broke the camel's back We've obtained a shipping receipt showing parts at the centre of the dispute were destined for Rex's base in Wagga Wagga. Lim Kim Hai denies they're in the custody of Rex. But do you know where the aircraft are? I've got no idea where the aircraft is now. We've heard that they're in Wagga. The aircraft is not in Wagga. You can go and go to Wagga yourself and look and see whether the aircraft is there. So, Sounds like you do know where they are. I do not know where they are. Well, you know where they're not. I really do not know where they are not. Ultimately, there is a contract. We honoured our contract. And so what happened after that? If we followed the normal contractual process, we would have gotten it done. But now they start this allegation, we'll have to let the courts sort it out. One thing in all of this is indisputable. The issues at Rex have left almost 670 people without a job. John Sharp believes this could have been avoided. The board was negotiating to sell its intercity operations to Virgin. We put in place a rescue plan and we thought that rescue plan would avoid the need for administration, it would avoid job losses, but unfortunately that plan was torpedoed. Who torpedoed it? Well, again, the former chairman. Virgin and its owner, Bain, declined to comment on their dealings with Rex. As the largest shareholder, Lim Kim Hai had demanded a seat at the negotiating table. What happened is this. I said that as a shareholder, if I'm not involved in it, I wouldn't accept it. it sounds like a threat. It's not a threat. A shareholder needs to act in its own best interests. You can't think that Rex is in a good position now. R Rex is not in a good position, but how would we know what would be the position of Rex? Just because you say that Virgin might or might not step in, doesn't mean that the airline would be in a good position. Sometimes people can be the sort of people who think that if it's not their idea, it's a bad idea and will reject it because it's not their idea and that's the situation we found ourselves in. Some of the same people who would today be accusing me of you know, various um, bad things are the same ones that have stuck by me since 2005 and before. So if I'm all that bad, why did you stick around? from one troubled airline to another. Queensland's Sunshine Coast, home to beaches, bathers and holiday makers. This was the home of Bonza. Bonza pledged to do things differently. A proudly bogan business flying big jets between regional centres, boasting ultra-cheap fares. Founder Tim Jordan had a dream. Bonza's DNA is about creating market growth, giving everybody, no matter where you live, the same opportunities to connect with friends and family. If Qantas or Virgin thought it was a great idea to fly 180-seat aeroplanes between Marucci and Cairns, well, they probably would have done it. There just wasn't the market there. It was just, it was economic suicide from the outset. Bonza. It was doomed from the beginning. That depends on who you talk to. I was a naysayer as well. I thought, oh, I don't know, who wants to go to Albury? But um, when we saw that it was so popular, I thought, well, why hasn't anyone done that before?
My name is Paul McEwen. I'm a commercial pilot and I live on the Sunshine Coast. Paul McEwen had a front row seat to the early Bonza Bonanza and to what he says was its preventable collapse in just over a year. The startup of Bonza went tremendously well. We really generated an airline from nothing and we had a great uh, wave of public support and our loads were really good, uh, which flew in the face of some of the uh, negative commentary we got before we started. Bonza soon announced plans for expansion, a new base on the glitzy Gold Coast by the end of 2023. But there was a problem. The airline barely had enough planes for its existing network. Management decided to bring in jets and crew from Canada. Local staff feared Bonza wouldn't get regulatory approvals in time for takeoff. I know for a fact that some of the senior pilots were bringing these points to the attention of the management in quite strong terms. Of course, what did happen is we started selling seats on tickets that we were never, ever going to be able to, uh, to supply. Regulator sign-off came much later than expected. The delay was catastrophic for the airline. 15,000 passengers' flights cancelled near Christmas. We saw this Shakespearean tragedy evolving before our eyes, you know. Everyone was thrilled to have a low-cost uh, option for air travel. And, you know, we would find that energy um, at barbecues and in social settings. People would, would say, oh, you work for Bonza, isn't that great? Isn't it so good for the Sunshine Coast? Well, after the disaster of the Gold Coast base, um, that mood totally changed. Do you have any sense then of why they would push on with this plan that it sounds like most people were saying may not work? Yeah, that's a good question. None of us have any idea. And we don't know what, um, what pressures were, were, were being forced on management by our funders. The answer to that takes us to the other side of the world. After more than a decade planning his airline dream, Tim Jordan found open minds and pockets in Miami, in investment firm 777 Partners. We believed that the old way of doing things was broken. We had a vision of a better way. 777 affected an air of money and celebrity. Its investments were varied, from personal injury payouts to aviation and financially stricken football clubs. Investigative journalist Paul Brown knows more than most about 777. This seemed to be a company with serious ambitions to change the Australian airline market. However, um, for anyone who accepted this deal at, at Bonza, I think there are questions to be asked because from the beginning, there were a series of, of red flags. Bonza relied on 777 for money and aircraft. But its administrators have been unable to find a formal funding agreement setting out how much cash they'd be given and when. We've been told there were also no contracts that specified how many planes they'd receive. It's our people, our brands, our culture. Bonza's funding came in bursts, sometimes late. But management maintained their faith in 777 founders Josh Wander and Stephen Pascoe. Josh Wander has a chequered history. He was the subject of drugs trafficking charges to which he pleaded no contest in college. That resulted in him being put on probation for a period of more than 10 years. 777's founders claimed they were personally bankrolling the firm's investments. It's since emerged a large insurance firm sat above the company, but its other sources of funding remain unclear. There are a series of Russian oligarchs, for instance, who invested money with 777. 
777 is now embroiled in multiple court cases, including one alleging half a billion dollars worth of fraud. We've confirmed the firm's investment in Bonza forms part of a US Department of Justice investigation into money laundering. 777 and its founders did not respond to our requests for comment. This is who Bonza did business with. Any responsible director obviously has duties that have a duty of care both to the business and to its customers to make sure that the money you're accepting comes from a reputable source. And I think that is where the, the failing occurred on the part of Bonza directors. Bonza collapsed in April. The financial woes come after the company that owns its aircraft lesser tried to repossess its planes. And I can't get onto a support line because everybody else is calling. With the company now in voluntary administration, it will have a hard time living up to its name. ASIC is now examining whether Bonza was trading insolvent. The airline's founder and chief executive, Tim Jordan, declined an interview with Four Corners. It's an absolute pleasure. He instead referred to a statement given in June that said the airline's progression was stymied by undercapitalisation and the repossession of its aircraft. Bonza's liquidation left more than 300 people out of a job. Paul McEwen believes the airline could have worked. If another airline was going to try the same model, and I hope they do because the Bonza model was a winner, I just hope, one, that they've got good backing, but also that they listen to the voice of experience in the company. You had to be there. You had to be there and in, be involved with the company to realise that, you know what, no, it didn't need to fail. It shouldn't have failed. It was a fantastic airline, a great product. And it's just such a shame that it went the way it did. There is one Australian who can lay claim to getting it right. Brett, I'll um, get you to introduce yourself. Sure, Brett Godfrey, former important person in aviation no longer. How about that? <laughs> Brett Godfrey co-founded Virgin Blue. The airline launched with great fanfare in 2000. Funded by British billionaire Richard Branson, its origin story is more bar than boardroom. It was literally a few too many pints in a, in a London pub. It, there was a dozen beer coasters where it just got knocked up. The, the vision was quite simple. We knew coming into the market that one of the incumbents, being Qantas or Ansett, um, was susceptible to failure. They had uncontested markets and, um, and they got to a point where they were both financially a bit, a bit strained. Brett Godfrey was sure his airline had a competitive edge. We just knew that we could sell every seat on our aeroplane for about $79 and make money. And we knew if they matched us, they'd be losing about a million to $2 million a day. And that was unsustainable. After more than 65 years in the sky, ANSET was the one to fail. Are any of the flights still flying at all? Nothing. All, all grounded. Everything's grounded. They've gone into liquidation. No more money. Its collapse paved the way for Virgin's success. Virgin came in with a brand, a different model, a preparedness to take on the big guys, and a, a consumer facing brand that was always deemed to be the underdog. Guess what? Australians, like nobody else on the planet, love an underdog. That underdog is now an aviation overlord. Its founder believes this duopoly works for consumers. I think the market is different, but both airlines need to be very, very cognizant that, you know, it is a slippery slope. They've got to keep innovating, they've got to keep lowering their costs, and they've got to keep financially fit or they will fail. I mean, all across the world that's happened with airlines. Even with the threat of fierce competition and the ghosts of airlines past, there's at least one new company willing to try its luck. Bill, I'd like to ask you something that I think many Australians will be wondering. How nuts do you have to be to start a new <laughs> airline in this environment? You have to be insane. 
So you have to have a degree of insanity. I'm Bill Askling. I'm the CEO of Koala Airlines. Bill Astling has been in aviation for decades, and he's no stranger to taking on major players. In the 1970s, he stared down a court challenge from ANSET to launch cargo carrier Air Express. For anybody to turn around to me and say there's not room for a third airline really isn't looking at the figures or looking at the projections. This is a, a growth and there are more people coming in from overseas and it can't all be done by two airlines. Exactly where Koala Airlines will fly, when it will launch, how it will compete and who's paying isn't clear. At this stage, Bill Asling doesn't want to reveal his business model. We're just not prepared to give away what our strategy is and allow competitors to be able to think, right, well, we can work on this or work on that. We've got a lot of support. Um, we've also got a lot of sceptics. I've had a few people who've, who've said, have you appointed the liquidator yet? So I've had to tell them we're putting them out to tender. <laughs> it's been argued Australia's landmass is too big and its population too small to sustain more carriers. This country is big enough for three airlines. The problem is that one company owns two of them. I mean, the ultimate solution, if you cared for the consumer, would be that Jetstar should not be owned by Qantas. Running Jetstar allows Qantas to compete on both ends of the aviation market. Professor Alan Fells believes even the threat of forced divestiture could benefit consumers. I think it would be highly desirable for our aviation market to be aware there's such a power. It would be up to the courts to determine if there is illegal behaviour, it's possible in some cases, the best remedy is break up. And if Qantas and Jetstar were competing with each other, instead of using each other at both ends of the market to sort of manoeuvre, um, I think we'd have a very, very different set of outcomes. But of course, Qantas will be forced to divest Jetstar on the day that pigs fly over the east-west runway. A Qantas spokesperson said breaking up Qantas Group would increase costs and put upward pressure on fares. The ACCC declined our interview request. Transport Minister Catherine King also declined to be interviewed. But in a statement, referenced the government's aviation white paper, which she said includes significant reforms to boost competition. Australia has a rich aviation history and a reliance on planes to keep us connected. But big ambitions, undercut by poor judgement and flawed policy, have left us with a market that doesn't always serve consumers. Australians in the small towns, they understand the competition issues that we're talking about here. This is a matter of life and death. The federal government says it wants to enable greater competition. But without action to match political words, we're at the mercy of an industry that's allowed to put us last. Mm -hmm.